Thank you very much, Christian. Sorry for the technical <laughs> uh, issues, but these things happen, I guess. And greetings to everyone from Canada. I hope everybody can hear me okay. It looked uh, good before. Okay, so challenges and opportunities, and there's plenty of them involving hydro power production, generation, and involving fish. And in the context that fish become an indicator of uh, the rest of the ecosystem and a healthy river has healthy fish populations in a sense. Okay. So I want to go over a couple of examples of uh, older hydroelectric power plants. Some of my examples will be in Canada, understandably, <laughs> uh, that are older and they have presented lots of challenges. But essentially, do we know if um, fish populations are affected by hydro projects, especially large ones? Yes, we do. But how do we assess those issues? And that's part of it. So here's a cascade of large uh, hydroelectric dams on the St. Lawrence River in Eastern Canada. You can see some of it goes from Ontario and to, into Quebec and into the Atlantic. And um, lots of studies over a long time had to be undertaken to find out what is happening with different species and of particular concern were the American eel and the uh, um, lake sturgeon. So you can see here that I'm illustrating where the, the, uh, the dams are. And one of the issues that a lot of these fish, the longer fish especially, faced was turbine mortality. And you can see for each dam was estimated after, after several years of study of 18 to 26% at each dam. So that accumulates as you go down the river. And um, some measures started to be taken, for example, eel passes, but a lot, of, a lot of measures still need to be done. So let's look at the historical uh, information on the populations of uh, this time is the uh, sturgeon, right? And you can see, you can go back to 1880s or so to today, you can see what size populations were there and what reductions are here in all the Great Lakes areas. Now, the reductions are not only because of the hydro projects. There's many other issues that over the years and many other countries have experienced the same thing. There may be water quality issues, there may be habitat issues, there may be flow issues. So all these accumulated to see the population drop. And the same thing with American eel and sometimes even fisheries had to be closed to accommodate, uh, to, to help these fish uh, survive and so on. So. For the eels especially, the cube, because they migrate downstream when they're adults and large fish, long fish, cumulative mortality was approaching 40%, so over two down. So that's getting very dramatic. So we know these, these effects are there, but do we have any effective ways to help these fish recover? And can we apply these in the older, uh, hydropower stations, but also in newer ones. And what's the difference? So uh, what tools do we have? I sort of put them together as what I call Ecohydraulic Trilogy, which provides a lot of solutions because it provides interdisciplinary work between all the relevant disciplines. It's not just hydraulics, it's not just hydrology, but ecology, biology, abilities of species of fish and this time we're concentrating on fish but let's be clear that there is a lot more aquatic organisms in the environment that we need. So one of the basic uh, parts of the trilogy is movements. We got to make sure that these aquatic organisms, especially fish, need to go up and down to fulfill their life cycle requirements and then what do we develop for that and what abilities can we incorporate into those facilities to uh, make them successful and effective. Environmental flows, e flows are is another big, big topic, which also people around the world are dealing with. And it involves many aspects of the environment, as well as habitat and populations and so on. And then let's not forget the morphology and the hydroecology of the, of the systems, sediment transport, 
in colder countries, ice dynamics is also very important. And these days, we can even talk about restoring rivers and, st uh, and streams, and sometimes you can justify removing dams. And that's another way to restore these populations and so on. But do we have any examples where some of these measures were actually undertaken and did they make a difference? Okay, this one does not involve a hydroelectric project, but it is a very illustrative uh, um, case because it has long-term data over several decades worth of data in terms of fish, in terms of physical variables and how difference, uh, how much of a difference that made. This is on the Fraser River on the west coast of Canada at Hell's Gate. Hell's Gate was always a natural canyon, difficult for fish to get through to reach their spawning grounds upstream, especially the sockeye uh, salmon that we're talking about here, but they were still making it through. So natural populations were actually doing well. And you can see 1913, just over 100 years ago, they reached that peak of 39 million fish that particular year. But if you see on the picture up at the top right, on the middle picture here, they, at the time, there was a national railway connecting Eastern and Western Canada together that was being built along this canyon. And what happened is during construction, a big slide fell down and the canyon became a lot more difficult for fish to get through. Actually, not many fish were able to get through. And it took until, uh, you know, over several years, of course, then the, re the population was reduced to down to 2 million fish from 39 million. And uh, the, it took several years between trying to design, trying to solve the problem and come up with, so it was not until 1947 that actually some of the first fishways were built here. You can see two of them, main fishways, which still exist today in the picture here of these ones, but later on others were added. You can understand that this is a very challenging condition with very turbulent flow and Water levels change up and down a lot, as well as horizontally. So different fishways are essentially there to cover different vertical drops, as well as horizontal changes in where fish are attracted to get in or not. And more recent studies have actually established that attraction efficiency is still sort of uh, a challenge, but still pretty high in the mid seventies. But once the fish get in, 100% move up. So that's very efficient system that way. And we have lots, like I say, decades of data to judge that. And there are other examples, for example, just south of this, uh, of this uh, river, on the Columbia River in the US, we have a cascade of hydroelectric dams actually that have existed for decades as well. And there, upstream and downstream facilities can be 95% or even more effective which may per dam, I mean, because of course, if when you have more than one dam, it accumulates and that becomes a lot lower. Of course, you need such high percentages, especially when you have um, a cascade of dams. Now, has that technology, which concentrated on salmon, been transferred elsewhere? Slowly. And now in the last few decades, I think there's a lot more work that has been done. And while maybe, before a lot of these, let's say, fishways for up or down were designed for mostly for salmon and they were suitable for salmon, but not necessarily for other fish. A lot more work has been done. And this meta-analysis actually provides mostly in Spain, suitable fishways in Liberia that actually were designed after 2000 with much better standards. And their effectiveness is reasonably high compared to what it used to be for these species before. So yes, salmonids was the uh, emphasis in the early times, but now this, uh, I'm glad to see that emphasis has switched to other species and we are improving the technology to reach high levels of such uh, uh, passage. Of course, in the meantime, we also develop stream simulation or nature-like approaches and for lower hydroelectric dams, that may be a solution as well, because we're trying to mimic natural systems 
how fish get through, what habitat they have. And on the left at the bottom, you can see my first uh, attempt at this was on a new highway built in the north of Canada. And there was very little information on anything, hydrology, species, habitat, anything. But we said, let's wrap uh, uh, the culvert around the bankful size of the stream, put have it, uh, put uh, substrate in there, and those culverts are actually still there, even though the picture was taken in 2008, as far as I know, they're still functioning properly. While other ones that were designed just to get the water through have actually washed out because of huge floods. That has been applied elsewhere in Canada and internationally, and you can see many examples of that. And on the right, I have another uh, way of moving fish up or down, and that's the trap and pump. One issue I want to mention, and actually I, I caught the tail end of the uh, morning's presentation, so there was some good discussion there too. Invasive species is another item we have to always uh, worry about and be careful about. So some systems are more amenable to uh, helping with that issue, others not as much, except for manual sorting. But what we do about downstream? And there's lots of technologies that have been developed for downstream as well. I'm giving you some a few examples here, and there's many more. And Fit Hydro actually has developed those tools even better, put them together, and has developed uh, more of those. So one way is to, of course, we mentioned before, turbines are an issue for a lot of fish, especially large fish. Smaller fish have better survival. So avoiding them would be one issue. So what about redesigning and streamlining the uh, bar racks in front of turbines that are there to uh, protect the turbines from trash? But at the same time, you don't want to lose much head. So streamlining them, you can tighten the uh, space in between them and save more larger fish than uh, the more regular rectangular kind of uh, bar racks. So that's one way. We also have angled barracks that can be leading fish in some sort of a bypass to safely avoid the turbines, guide them away from the turbines and move them downstream in a safe way. And then the next item that in the last few decades people have been working on with quite a bit of success is, can we improve the survival of fish in turbines? Can we redesign the turbines uh, to improve things? And yes, started with a an ancient idea of Archimedes and lots of research in that area and we're moving in that direction with uh, some very good results. Others are, especially in smaller hydro projects, these are feasible. You can guide fish with even fine springs so even small fish can be guided away from turbines and moved uh, uh, downstream. So, and there's, these have been applied, for example, this one in Sweden and very successful results. So. The technology is improving for large and small fish to avoid uh, turbines and mortality. Another way is we knew that spillways, uh, fish going over spillways were safer, especially if the downstream of the spillway there was a nice deep pool and they were not hitting anything in between. But can we improve them? Because the traditional spillways are just vertical and do species, especially these eels that are touch and feel, thigmotactic as we call them, can we improve it by shaping the spillway differently? Put them at an angle, for example, 45 degrees or 30 degrees. And these studies have illustrated that yes, that can improve things. And maybe the, the, not the entire fishway has to, uh, spillway has to be um, at that uh, angle, but Portions of it on the left and on the right might be a good solution as well and possibly a feasible solution. Of course, flows is a very critical aspect and over many years studies have been done to try to quantify because that, to be honest, if we can quantify the problem, I think we have a better chance to uh, see what implications it has on fish populations in this case or other aquatic organisms. So a lot of quantitative tools have been developed, whether that's indexes or modeling like this example here that we were involved in developing or applying other tools. And there's a lot of tools out there. I'm very happy to see 
and we can manage the flows uh, and improve the situation. Of course, balancing hydropower generation with how much flow you can release and still address environmental and social issues and economic issues, of course, very important. Here's an example of a hydro picking um, project, which when it was built, not much attention was paid to habitat and fish and so on. But more recently, there was pressure on the power company to do something about it and release flows. You can see, for example, there was practically no flows released. Uh, they had to, whatever they was spared from hydro was the only thing released. And you can see on the left, it was essentially dry bed below them down for several times of the year. And mortality also was an issue. So the first agreement was let's release 75 cubic meters per second and then do a study and in, and, uh, an inflow study to see where, whether that does the job for the species there. And of course, a lot of stake, lake sturgeon were actually involved here as many, uh, as well as many other species. So this gives you an idea of what the regulated hydrograph looks like over the years and what it used to be more naturalized. Some of these hydrographs had to be synthesized essentially. But the study that was done defined biological, biologically significant periods and for each one came up with a recommendation on flows. The whole thing was reviewed. In Canada actually we have a, a science review system that is run mostly by fisheries and oceans, which is one of the, the, the main department when it involves fish across Canada, and also have a chance to review the scientific validity of the studies, plus make extra recommendations. Here's another approach to the whole issue, and this was applied and still is applied to BC hydro dams, um, especially the smaller ones, older ones. Again, flows were the main problem in this case, but essentially the whole thing was designed as experiment in prototype, in real life experiments. So here's one uh, hydro project with the hydrograph uh, on the top there from 1914 to 1947. You can see there's very little release for any environmental issues. Then the first trial was to release a certain amount of flow and see for 2000, for example, to 2008, that was the trial, what difference does that make? And the main measure was juvenile Pacific salmon was the main metric. Are they more abandoned or less and so on for so many years? Then a higher flow was actually uh, tried and that also um, told us whether the population is doing well, whether the higher flow is justified because you lose power production that way too. So with, through, through these experiments, you can find out what is sort of an optimum solution for flows. Then the other aspect is habitat. What can we do about habitat? Because that hydro projects also rearrange that. And even though this is not relating to hydro, the main point I'm trying to make here is that again, we need, there's a couple of ways to do this. We need a long-term data again to monitor and find out how well some of these measures may work. And one way is to compare a newly generated channel, which was in this case was generated for a diamond mine, in, uh, the first diamond mine in Northern Canada. And can we create habitat in this channel that might be equivalent to what a natural channel would produce? And immediately, the study would indicate, as you can see on the red line at the bottom, that these young Arctic grayling were growing, yes, and they were using the channel, but they were growing much slower than the natural streams nearby. Now, the whole thing was revisited 14 years later, and now they were converging a little bit more. You can see the red dot versus the green dot sort of average on those three. So there's still a difference between the two, but it's smaller than over here. So one way is to let nature take its course, but that may take a long time when it comes to habitat restoration, or we can more actively manage it and help it get there quicker. Sorry. Then of course, there may be other 
aspects you can do, including um, um, hydro, um, uh, sorry, dam removal. One yes. other aspect is climate change, of course, and maybe yes, some dams- we are running out of time, please. Yeah, sorry. Okay, one, one minute to wrap it up. Hydro, uh, like uh, climate change is also another issue and some hydro dams can release colder water to compensate partly for that. So that, of course, there's a lot of research still ongoing. Here's a tool that we have developed on swimming performance that you can use. And studies are still ongoing around the globe. Here's one example from China, for example. And there's lots of information available now. And here's just uh, some list of references that you can see when you have a, a chance to. So essentially, eco-hydraulics can provide trade-offs and achieve cost-effective balance between power generation and environmental conservation and help us maintain or rebuild fish populations. So of course, for exist for new dams, it's easier to apply that technology. It's a lot harder and more expensive to apply it to alter to other technologies. And the best solutions are designing them right at the beginning. And let's not forget adaptive management is also essential in these uh, issues because we don't have the answer to all those questions. Thank you very much.